Good evening. Continued reaction tonight to the indictment of former President Donald Trump as more candidates announce their intentions to seek the Oval Office in 2024, including South Carolina Senator Tim Scott announcing a committee surrounding the idea of running for president. I'll speak to New York Times Chief White House correspondent Peter Baker. Also coming up, leaked Pentagon documents and the potential impact that could have on the Russia-Ukraine war. Also, Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gerskovich detained in Russia. I'll speak to former Defense Secretary and former CIA Director Leon Panetta ahead. Former President Donald Trump has found himself in a variety of legal challenges, the most recent, of course, being in Manhattan, where the grand jury voted to indict him over falsifying business records, of course, in relation to the hush money payment made to adult filmmaker Stormy Daniels. Of course, that is just one of many legal troubles. As former GOP Congressman Joe Walsh told me last night, he believes we could also hear from Georgia soon in, in regards to the election meddling issue. Uh, joining me now to discuss some of the latest as it relates to the former president and also to discuss more broadly kind of the role that he's playing, given that he is now a 2024 candidate, et cetera, is Peter Baker, chief White House correspondent for The New York Times. Thanks so much for making the time. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, let's just start out with, obviously, you know, you follow this scene quite closely. When you look at the fact Donald Trump was president for four years, um, he he could be president again, theoretically, given that he's running for president. Um, what do you make of, of all of the things that have kind of transpired after he's left the White House, particularly with um, this hush money payment and with this most recent indictment? What could that mean moving forward for him? Well, it's a great question. You know, one of the things we have discovered with Donald Trump is there are so many firsts, so many unprecedented, so many things we've never seen before, so many lines crossed. And we've never seen uh, a situation quite like this, where a former president was running for his old office uh, in the modern era of social media and traditional media and television and cable television, and especially, of course, with this kind of a legal troubles that he has. You're right to point out that it's not just the New York case that is a challenge to him. He potentially could face up to three other indictments. And that's something we've never seen in American history before. So, you know, what will it do for him? It's I think one of the things we've learned, I think, in the last few years is making predictions is a bad idea because we never really know what's about to happen. But I do think, obviously, that this has um, galvanized his base on his behalf. Right now, he seems to be even stronger as he runs for the Republican nomination than he was before the indictment. At the same time, it's hard to see that ha how that helps him with the general election voters like independents and swing voters and even Democrats that he might want to win in 2024. And obviously, there's a lot of people who who were really close to Donald Trump during his administration. For example, you have Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who at least it appeared publicly that like the two of them were, you know, very closely aligned with each other, not just, you know, politically, but also when you look at, for example, the COVID pandemic, you know, Ron DeSantis managed things in a very Trump way, so to speak. Um, now Donald Trump has come out. He's criticized Florida Governor Ron DeSantis um, Mike Pence is seen as a potential candidate to enter the race. Donald Trump and Mike Pence have had some uh, public disagreements, so to speak. I guess, what do you make of all of these former Trump allies who uh, now don't seem to be too closely aligned with the former president? And how does that kind of fit into the 2024 race? Well, one thing you know with Donald Trump is the one thing that matters most to him is loyalty. As he sees it, if you are in any way critical of him or run against him, obviously, you are disloyal and it's, it's personal. It's all about personal for him. And he believes that uh, Ron DeSantis owes his political career to Trump. And it's true that when DeSantis won the governorship in Florida, he presented himself as the most Trumpian candidate out there. He, has, he had a TV ad with his small baby child dressed in a MAGA onesie. He read a book about bo building a border wall. He presented himself as the most true Trumpian candidate in Florida. And now, of course, they're on opposite sides of this potential Republican nomination battle. So, you know, you're going to see a lot of this. There's a, a lot of Republicans who are ready for Trump to move on, but he's not ready to move on. And most of his voters for the moment don't seem ready to move on either. And with some of the candidates who have declared, obviously, a former South Carolina governor, Nikki Haley, but you also have some people who aren't necessarily as well known, like you have a small businessman, Vivek Ramaswamy, who's announced both of them have, I guess, it, it appears almost been kind of fearful to come out and criticize the former president too extensively, which is something that, you know, most people would be used to during a presidential campaign. What do you make of that aspect of it? 
Well, because they want to present themselves as alternatives to Trump, but not alternatives to Trump voters. Remember, they don't want to offend Trump's base because they believe that's key to success in the Republican Party right now. So the goal for a Haley or a DeSantis or a, a Vivek uh, would be to say, I agree with a lot of the things that President Trump did. I, I'm, I'm on your side. I just think that you ought to have somebody who can do the things he promises without so many court dates. You know, without so many, uh, without so much baggage there, and that's the all that's the argument that they're going to try to make, and it may work at some point. For the moment, it hasn't yet, but we're still early in this cycle. All right, we'll leave it there. Peter Baker, White House correspondent for the New York Times. Thanks so much for making the time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Juan. Really appreciate it. Good talking to you. Obviously, lots of discussion over the course of the past few days pertaining to the Pentagon leak of classified documents. Plus the ongoing war in Ukraine, a lot of topics to get to. And joining me now is Leon Panetta, the former Secretary of Defense and the former CIA Director. Thanks so much for making the time. I appreciate it. Good to be with you. Uh, let's just start out with this most recent uh, leak of classified documents uh, from the Pentagon. I guess I'm just wondering how, from your perspective, something like this is even feasibly possible for these documents to have been leaked. Well, that's obviously what uh, is being investigated by both the Pentagon uh, and the Justice Department. Uh, the uh, the information right now uh, really isn't very clear as to uh, why it was done, how it was done, and who did it. Uh, and uh, they're trying to investigate uh, the situation. Uh, we know a hundred pages of Pentagon's highly classified information uh, made its way onto a social media site uh, called Discord, uh, and that's how it was found. Uh, how it got there, uh, how it was able to be uh, gained by uh, whoever uh, found the information, uh, and how it was placed on that particular site uh, is just not very clear right now. Uh, some think that, uh, you know, it could be the Russians who are behind it because there's information that relates to uh, strengths and weaknesses uh, of Ukraine. Uh, some think that uh, it could be Ukraine uh, trying to uh, deceive the Russians as to their particular strength. But uh, the reality is that we would just be guessing uh, right now without uh, clear information as to what happened. Uh, bottom line is we don't know. We've seen we've seen information, classified information provided in the past. Uh, Snowden provided uh, great uh, amounts of classified information. Uh, a fellow named Manning did the same thing. So we have had those who have revealed uh, classified information. How this was done, however, uh, still remains to be determined. And you mentioned the connection between the leaked documents and the ongoing war uh, in Ukraine. How influential could this potentially be, if I mean at all, and, and what do you think as it relates to how this could potentially impact the war in Ukraine? As you mentioned, it, you know, displays some some things as it relates to that. It shows some weaknesses in their air defense system. Talk a little bit about that. Well, look, it, you know, I think even though we don't know exactly uh, how this information was obtained, uh, I think it's fair to say that the, the leaking of highly classified information like we have uh, does damage our national security. Uh, first of all, it damages the sources for that information. In order to get intelligence, uh, we need to have sources, uh, spies, uh, individuals who are in sensitive positions. Uh, and uh, when you release information like this, it can give our adversaries an indication as to where those sources are. So it could, it, you know, these are people who put their lives on the line. So it could jeopardize them. Secondly, uh, this is timely information uh, related to the situation in Ukraine. Uh, and 
because it is timely and because it outlines strengths and weaknesses, uh, it could have some impact on the military decisions that have to be made, particularly by the Ukrainians who are working on an offensive uh, within the next few weeks to try to push the Russians out of the Donbass area uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so it, it could have some impact as to uh, some of the decisions that uh, they will make. And at the same time, it could affect some of the decisions that the Russians might make as well. Uh, it also impacts on our reputation and credibility because some of the information released indicates uh, some, some of the intelligence uh, that uh, we had with regards to allies. Uh, I think the UAE was one of those, Israel was another. Uh, and so uh, that could wind up uh, hurting our relationship and requiring that we do some repair work. So even though we don't know the full extent of what has happened here, I think it's fair to say that uh, this information uh, indeed does damage uh, our security uh, in a way that uh, that we have to worry about in the future. And moving forward, do you think there are any points of weakness, so to speak, that could potentially be improved to ensure that leaks of this nature don't happen again? Uh, well, again, uh, it really depends on the investigation as to what exactly happened. Uh, if this was an individual uh, within the Pentagon, uh, then that's a very serious matter. Uh, some have told me that uh, there were there were photographs of materials uh, that what's appearing appear to be photographs of the sensitive information. Uh, that means that somebody within the Pentagon uh, was able to retrieve this information and take pictures of it. Uh, that that's very sensitive and very dangerous uh, because uh, if, uh, if that's what took place, it means that the security associated with classified information, and from my own experience, we followed uh, very strict rules as to how classified information was to be handled. If there were briefings on it, uh, that information would then be secured uh, it would be placed uh, ultimately in burn bags of one kind or another. There are rules with regards to how that information is handled. So it's really important to try to find out how this leak occurred. Uh, stop the leak, because if there's more information here that is going to come out, uh, it will further damage our national security interests. And more generally speaking, when you look at this, obviously has some connections to the war in Ukraine, but I guess putting the, the leaked documents aside, when just looking at the war in Ukraine and how it's kind of progressed, I mean, obviously, when it first started, not very many people necessarily would have imagined, at least Ukrainians, you know, people on the ground there, perhaps didn't have as much confidence that it would have, you know, been able that they would have been able to hold out as long as they have. Uh, what do you make as to where Ukraine is at in their fight against Russia? Well, I, I consider this war to be uh, extremely pivotal uh, because it will determine not only what happens to democracy in Ukraine, uh, it'll determine what happens to democracies in the 21st century. Uh, this is the first time since World War II uh, that a tyrant has made the decision to invade a sovereign democracy. Uh, that's what Putin did uh, in invading Ukraine. Uh, and it's what Hitler did when he invaded Poland and Czechoslovakia in World War II. So we know that it is very important to draw the line on those who would invade sovereign democracies. Uh, and thank God the United States and our NATO allies came together to make very clear to Russia that Russia would pay a price for this invasion. Uh, and they have. Uh, they have seen some very tough economic sanctions placed on their economy. Uh, we have provided important weapon systems and training uh, to the Ukrainians. Uh, we have reinforced NATO. But most importantly, we've seen very brave 
Ukrainian fighters who've been able to use the training, use the weapons, uh, and effectively stop a Russian invasion. Uh, the intelligence on Russia uh, was that uh, it was only going to take a few days once they invaded, uh, and that they would be, be able to take uh, the capital, Kiev, and bring down the Ukrainian government. Uh, that intelligence was wrong. Uh, and the reality is that uh, Russia uh, was much weaker than what we assumed uh, was the case. Uh, they did not have very good command and control. Uh, they did not have very good logistics. Uh, they did not have very good weapons. Uh, the recruitment that they had, uh, the fighters were not well trained. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, Ukrainians, because of their bravery and because of the support of the United States and our allies, uh, have been very successful at not only stopping the invasion, but pushing the Russians back. I think ultimately, it's going to be very important for Ukraine to continue the offensive against the Russians. They're planning an offensive. Uh, that will be critical to pushing the Russians out of the Donbass area uh, in, uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, and ultimately, my hope is that it will force Putin to either withdraw or to ultimately negotiate. But to get there, I think it's really important for the United States, our allies in the Ukraine, to show the kind of force that's necessary in order to get the Russians to be pushed back out of the Donbass area and ultimately out of Ukraine. And, and just before you go, Mr. Secretary, I want to get your opinion on, on a slightly separate matter. A reporter with the Wall Street Journal, Evan Gershkovich, who has been um, wrongfully held in Russia as of right now, you know, the hashtag I stand with Evan is trending on various social media networks. Um, it, it is in many respects just another example of Russia's growing um, kind of obliviousness to you know, democracy and to the freedom of press, et cetera. What do you make of what has transpired thus far, not just with Evan Gershkovich, but obviously it speaks to, I'm sure, a broader issue of, you know, democracy, freedom of press, et cetera. Well, obviously we've identified Putin as a war criminal because of uh, the things he's done in the Ukraine, the fact that he's attacked innocent men, women, and children. Uh, and uh, we've seen the kind of destruction uh, that's been involved in this war. Uh, there was a beheading today that was, uh, uh, you know, another indication of just how brutal uh, the Russian forces have been. Uh, and Putin's effort now to go after a correspondent, a Wall Street correspondent, who from everything I've read, really wanted to present an, an accurate portrayal of what Russia is all about and did a pretty good job of presenting that. Uh, what it shows is, is Putin has reached a point where he will resort to any kind of brutal tactic uh, in order to uh, promote uh, Russian interests. Uh, his, his arrest of this correspondent is for one reason and one reason only to be able to use that correspondent uh, as a trade in order to get uh, spies who are uh, Russian spies who are incarcerated in one country or another uh, to get them back. Uh, so he's using this individual solely to try to uh, gain uh, his, his own spies back, but also to show the Russians that he's still able to get some things done. So it is, uh, you know, it's a brutal step by Putin. It only further confirms uh, what an outlaw he is. Uh, and ultimately, I think when he does these kinds of things, the only one that's really hurt is Putin. Uh, the world looks at Putin uh, and makes a very clear decision that this individual has no regard uh, for the rule of law. Okay, we'll leave it there. Leon Panetta, the former defense secretary and former CIA director, thanks so much for making the time. Really appreciate it. Good. It's uh, good to be with you, and I congratulate you on uh, having uh, this kind of podcast. 
Uh, I think it's, uh, it's very important to stay abreast of the news because that's the only way we ultimately can protect our democracy. Of course. Thanks so much.